Please be aware that as a movie commentary channel, the Film Optimist is a spoiler-rich environment. Whenever a movie is discussed in a video, the chances for spoilers are high. Enjoy responsibly and in great excess. Hold on, I've got to see if I am in focus here. Yeah, that's pretty good. Any horror fan can probably rattle off an entire catalog of franchises for you. Multi-picture series that sometimes tell a larger story, sometimes focus on a single character in multiple stories, or that sometimes build their entire identity around just a title. Excuse me, no, I said horror franchises, not horrible ideas for a franchise. And with the low production cost to high profit potential of the horror genre, it's easy for studios to return to the well over and over again. The Friday the 13th franchise, as of this filming, is 12 movies long. Halloween, 13 movies. A Nightmare on Elm Street, 9. Hellraiser, 11. Child's Play is actually two diverging franchises, totaling eight movies between them. Children of the Corn, would you believe that the Children of the Corn franchise is 11 movies long? Most people are barely aware that there's a Children of the Corn 2. By comparison, the Phantasm franchise can seem almost paltry, with merely five movies to its run, and arguably the smallest total box office take of any of them. But among the franchises, there's something that makes it unique. Almost every other major horror franchise was extended not by its creator, but by the studio. Wes Craven had little to nothing to do with The Nightmare on Elm Street 2, and in fact wouldn't return to the series until Wes Craven's new Nightmare, the seventh in the series. The original Hellraiser was written and directed by Clive Barker, based on a novella written by Clive Barker, featuring a cast full of close personal friends of Clive Barker. But by the second installment, Clive Barker receives a story by credit, and the third movie didn't involve any work from Barker whatsoever. Phantasm may only be five movies long, but through the entire run of the series, it remained under the control of its creator, Don Toscarelli, who directed and wrote the first four films and produced and co-wrote the fifth, and as such, it avoids the pitfalls of the other franchises, genre and mood drift and a loss of thematic consistency, making it one of the most consistent series in the horror genre. In Benoit and Don Coscarelli's Phantasm Compendium, Coscarelli reflects on this close relationship to the movies, saying, I already know what the epitaph inscribed on my own tombstone will one day ultimately read. The Guy Who Made Phantasm. <laughs> Born in 1954 in Tripoli, Libya, the guy who made Phantasm began his film career when he was still in his early teens, of submitting short films to contests on local television in his adopted hometown of Long Beach, California. He was 19 and fresh out of high school when he took his passion project, a self-produced feature-length drama two years in the making entitled Jim the World's Greatest, and sold it to Universal Pictures, making him, at the time, the youngest independent filmmaker to ever sell a movie to a major studio. It's a little bit like if uh, Doogie Howser had been cutting film instead of cutting people's chests open. The cast of Jim included Michael Baldwin, a young actor whose father was an animator and producer on Mr. Magoo and The Rocky and Bullwinkle Show, a young Vietnam veteran turned actor named Reggie Bannister, and Rory Guy, a journalist who had written for TV Guide and composed liner notes for albums by Frank Sinatra and the Beatles, but who had later become known to horror fans by his pseudonym, Angus Scrim. A year after Jim debuted, Coscarelli's follow-up, the teenage comedy Kenny and Company, would sell to 20th Century Fox, again featuring Michael Baldwin and Reggie Bannister among his cast. It was a surprise to his growing ensemble of actors then when Coscarelli contacted them to say that his next project 
was going to be a horror movie. Phantasm was reportedly inspired by a dream that Coscarelli had, in which he was running down an endless hallway, pursued by a flying chrome ball that featured a giant needle protruding from its surface. Coscarelli was not entirely certain what was happening in the dream, but he knew that if the sphere caught up with him, it would kill him. Now, the dream may have actually happened, but in 2013, Coscarelli would tell David Sutton of the Forte and Times that his decision was a career move at heart, noting that his first two films didn't do that well at the box office, and that he had been told horror movies were always successful. <laughs> end approaches, but it is not yet. Part of the enduring charm of the Phantasm series is that its first installment feels so much like the kind of movie that someone in their late teens or early twenties would make. There's a kid whose cool older brother drives an awesome car, jams on the acoustic guitar with his best friend, and gets laid in the cemetery, but who can also be counted on to fight monsters to save his younger brother. Uh, basically, everything people like about Stranger Things long before there was Stranger Things. The imagery of the movie is a mixture of modern cool with the sleek lines of the flying spheres and classic horror with its dark cemeteries and black suit-clad antagonist. And there's also buckets of blood flying in every direction. You better move away from the car before the gas tank blows. I thought cars only blow up like that in the movies. Yeah, me too. As the series continues, it may mature slightly in its storytelling, but it never loses that feeling of being something rough and youthful that's obsessed with cool without ever achieving polish and smooth edges. Four-barreled, sawed-off shotguns, a classic muscle car tearing down the highway, and endless variations on killer flying chrome spheres that keep finding new, imaginative ways to open up people's skulls. And some of that straight-from-the-id-to-the-screen feel can be attributed to the fact that, even when the Phantasm series briefly flirted with major studio interference, it remained very much a family affair. Coscarelli's father not only helped find financing for the original film, but his mother also handled pretty much all of the early makeup and gore effects. And Coscarelli started the series with his adopted family of actors. Baldwin, Scrim, Bannister had all been there at the start of his career, and with the exception of a brief recast of Baldwin at the studio's insistence, they were the core of the franchise for all of its installments. As the series went on, it added in new adopted members of Coscarelli's troupe. Bill Thornbury as the Too Cool For Words Jody, Gloria Lynn Henry as Rocky, Kathy Lester as the Lady in Lavender, for a series that kills off a lot of characters shortly after they're introduced, it's actually managed to develop a fairly deep lore and cast of characters. Jody. Jody. What the hell are you doing here? You're dead. So what else is new? And family is a major theme in Phantasm. Not just who shares your blood, but those you choose for your family as well, and what it means when those people are taken away from you. By the beginning of the first movie, Jody and Mike have lost their parents, leaving them alone in the world, and Jody is reluctantly preparing to split up the family even further, intending to leave Mike in the care of an orphanage while he leaves town. But the machinations of the tall man reinforce the ties between the two. Then, when Jody is seemingly killed, Reggie, his best friend, becomes Mike's surrogate brother, stepping in to take on the role of caretaker. Intense situations form unbreakable bonds, even as the world works as hard as it can to break or dissolve those bonds. Leaving town is a big part of Phantasm as well. In fact, 
It could be argued it's the core theme of the series. Starting in the late 70s and running through 2016's Phantasm Ravager, the common visual thread is the long road through vanishing America. First, the small town depicted in the original film, where mysterious deaths are diminishing the local population, and the young people, like Jody, are all looking for a way out. Then, as the series moves beyond its original setting, we're told that the path of the tall man leads from town to town, and those towns all show the same effects of the tall man's arrival. Small towns with shrinking populations, growing graveyards, shuttered businesses on Main Street, and former family homes falling into ruin. But where many movies and TV shows would depict such a thing as being caused by modernization, Phantasm suggests a more insidious culprit. The rot, Phantasm suggests, is coming from inside the small towns and spreading to the larger. In one vision of the future, Mike sees a major city reduced to the same rubble as the small main streets that he's been driving through, suggesting that the small towns are not the target, but rather the point of origin. And the nature of the tall man cannot be ignored either. Everywhere he goes, he's a funeral director. Looming at the back of funerals in his dark suit, moving through the streets in a black hearse, slowly packing everybody away in their coffins. His style is timeless because, well, funerals are a business that doesn't visibly evolve. I'm sure at this moment there is a funeral director somewhere who has already started composing an angry comment, so let me take a moment to clarify. I'm not saying your industry never does anything new. I'm certain there's great innovation and imagination in the funeral sector, but the public image of funerals and what people expect from a funeral director doesn't change. In many ways, Angus Scrimm's tall man fits as naturally into the image of a funeral director today as he did when he debuted in the 1970s, and as well as he would have in the era in which we discover he first appeared, the 1860s. That's when the friendly and personable Jebediah Morningside, seeking a way to make the world a better place through the science of harmonics, stepped through a portal and re-emerged as a completely alien creature wearing the unfortunate Morningside's skin as a disguise. He is, in many ways, the America of the past, slowly rotting the America of today from the inside out. I don't want to say white privilege, but... There's a lot of white privilege going on in this theme. I won't hurt you. You're killing the world! I'll go away, and I won't ever come back. So if the tall man is the harbinger of the rot that is eating society from its toes up, then surely our heroes, Reggie, Jody, Mike... They have to be the solution, right? They have to be the last hope of humanity to stand against this creeping death. Well, no, not exactly. It's just not that simple. Jody himself gets turned into one of the killer chrome spheres, albeit one that has some awareness of his former self. And Mike, well, Mike is possibly not strictly human. In fact, the longer the series continues, the more it becomes apparent that he may actually be the same kind of creature as the tall man himself. They may fight the decay that the tall man represents, but they can't help being a part of the same process. They grew up in the world that the tall man was already working to build, and they lived by his rules long before they were even aware that he existed. Once again, I'm saying... There's a lot of white privilege involved in this theme. That's Mike and Jody, and then there's Reggie. Oh, Reggie. It's not unusual for directors and producers to have actors that become their good luck charms. 
Sam Raimi is always looking for a place to put Bruce Campbell into his movies. J.J. Abrams always wants Greg Grunberg to get at least a cameo. And actor Reggie Bannister has been not only in every installment of the Phantasm franchise, but in most of Coscarelli's films. The character of Reggie Bannister in the Phantasm films was named for the actor, and the character was modeled to be a spotlight for the actor, featuring the actor's talents, such as songwriting and guitar playing. What was a small supporting role in the original film became in many ways the emotional center and the actual star of the franchise. Unlike Mike and Jody, who are struggling to figure out their part in the overall narrative, Reggie's role is simple. The tall man took his town, took his friends and family, and all Reggie has left now is fighting back. Even if the fight is ultimately futile, it's still what drives him to keep on keeping on. Does that make Reggie the hero? Does that make him humanity's last best hope? Does it make him our savior and salvation? No, it makes him just a guy. A guy trying to do everything he can and hoping beyond hope that it's enough. Sometimes that makes him an action hero, and sometimes it makes him the biggest patsy on earth. But his dedication to his friends and to the fight is unquestionable. Those frail human emotions again. Do you not understand? Your kind are simply skin sacks of water and meat. And when a few random electrons fire off in that puny brain of yours, you're ready to annihilate yourself for this, this feeble sensation you call loyalty. Maybe I'm being ridiculous in all this analysis. Maybe I'm seeing things that aren't there. But isn't that fitting, too, for a series named Phantasm? And I sort of just talk all the time. It doesn't even need to make sense. Just noises are fine. Boop, 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 boop. Coscarelli has said that one of his favorite parts of working on this series of movies has been hearing the themes and hidden meanings that his fans find in the story. To that end, he's intentionally left parts of the story open that would have been explained already in other franchises. We know, for instance, that the tall man was human once upon a time, but we still don't know exactly what he is now, we don't know if Mike has always been one of the tall man's kind, or if he's being taken over. We don't even honestly know if any of it is ultimately real, as at different times in the franchise, it's been suggested that it's all in Mike's head, or all in Reggie's head, or that the tall man is warping reality in ways that nobody has ever fully understood, and nothing that has been perceived by the characters can be trusted. The word phantasm is associated with illusions, ghosts, and dreams, things that don't make sense in our day-to-day -day life. Dreams, in particular, follow a logic of their own as our brains attempt to process and clear the junk that we accumulate inside of our neural passageways in our ordinary day-to-day -day life. The Phantasm franchise is a series of dreams, operating with the illogical logic of dreams, and interpreting Phantasm is much like, well, interpreting dreams. Perhaps, ultimately, we wind up revealing more about ourselves than about the story itself. But maybe that's why the story exists in the first place, for us to find ourselves within it. Almost. Almost. Almost made it. Part of the enduring charm. Ah. The second installment in the Phantasm franchise was the only film to recast a member of the Central Troop. Instead of Michael Baldwin, the role of Mike went to James LaGrosse at the insistence of Universal, who had picked up the series following the success of the first installment. As Coscarelli tells it, Universal promised him creative control of everything else, but only if he agreed to allow them to re-audition every character that had carried over from the original. Reportedly, Reggie Bannister almost lost the character named after himself to a young, up-and-coming actor named Michael Ironside. When Phantasm II didn't perform as well as Universal had hoped, 
they shifted production on Phantasm 3 to their direct-to-video slate, which meant less money, less promotion, and less support in general from the studio, but it also meant less studio interference and the return of Michael Baldwin to the role he had originated. And it meant that once his contract with Universal was completed by delivery of the third movie, Phantasm was once again completely in its creator's hands. Thanks for checking out the video. Relevant links are in the description below, including where to find the Phantasm movies if you haven't already seen them. Phantasm is just one in a long line of horror franchises, as we've already mentioned. What's your franchise of choice? And, if it applies, what's the moment for you when the franchise jumped the shark? Let me know in the comments below, and if you've watched this far, try to work the word GLOBE into your answer somewhere as our secret code to know that we both belong in the Cool Kids group. Until next time... Watch like it means something.